Uh, we've created five domains uh, to look at that, and North Network is going to report on 14 uh, outcome indicators this year. The main motivation for this actually uh, is, you know, the, 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 our funder, the provincial government, doesn't really uh, hasn't really got a, a, a big contract with us with our requirements, so we're trying to beat them to it by telling them what the requirements for us should be so that we tell them what we're supposed to do rather than that they tell us. So that's part of the strategy here, tongue in cheek. Uh, we're actually saving some money. We, we don't know what the ultimate you know, cost benefit analysis will be for telehealth. There isn't a whole lot of a great research on this yet. Uh, we're hoping to get some help from some of our University of Waterloo friends uh, who are volunteering to help us with that. But we have done a bit of analysis uh, on things like the Northern Health Travel Grants Program. That's a program that subsidizes uh, patients uh, and a family member on occasion to uh, travel to receive medical care in Northern Ontario. Um, and according to our calculations, we're now saving that program about $250,000 a month at current volumes, or almost $3 million a year, so a significant amount of money right there. Of course, uh, we've also documented a lot of savings for uh, uh, patients and their families, uh, but uh, uh, ultimately we don't know the, uh, the, the, the benefit on the whole system. Uh, we're not the only uh, telehealth network in Ontario. There are two other smaller networks uh, in the west and the east uh, that we uh, work with. We're right now trying to become interoperable. We have a committee that meets every couple of weeks to look at uh, clinical, technical, um, and evaluation uh, issues to make sure that we can work together. We'd like to have one patient, uh, a patient anywhere being seen by anyone anytime. That's the goal uh, of that committee. Uh, so, uh, I'm down to the last part of this presentation where I just want to tell you what I think are really the four uh, major areas of growth that uh, we're going to see happen. And again, this isn't theoretical uh, in the sense that I'm not looking long term, I'm talking about the next one to three years in terms of what our plans are going to be. Uh, the first two things that you see here are really things that we have to do to continue to accommodate the growth of activity that we have. So. Uh, I, I showed you the prototype scheduling portal. We need an education portal as well so that people can keep track of their education credits. They know all the events that are happening uh, so that we can actually, uh, you know, let's say you came to my event today um, and I turned out I told you there was a great drug for disease X and you went away and started giving it to all of your friends and family members uh, and then I discovered that it's like Vioxx and it's actually going to kill you. Um, I want to know who was at that event so I can send you an email saying, you know what I said last week? I lied. Uh, so I think we want to start to build that kind of an infrastructure where we can uh, continue the contact with learners. In terms of other areas of growth, I mean, number one is really mainstreaming telehealth. And this, is a, this slide gives you an example of kind of telehealth utopia. Okay, so here's a, a happy doctor in his office, and uh, he just took down the picture of his, uh, you know, maybe his wife or his kids that was on the wall. Uh, and put up this little flat panel screen. Uh, and, uh, you know, when he walks into his office, there could be a patient on his bed or there could be a patient a thousand kilometers away. Uh, and that's how telehealth gets integrated into their practice. So we actually bought about 25 of these right now. We're, we're doing a rollout of these to uh, specialist offices to see if we can get this completely integrated into their practice. Uh, the other part of mainstreaming is getting this to all the places where it needs to be the family physician's office the long-term care facility, the visiting nurse's uh, office, uh, and even the client. So mainstreaming means making this technology ubiquitous. The other, uh, I mean, this is an example. This is last March. You ever heard of March Madness? Yeah, March Madness, see, the fiscal year for governments ends March 31. So if they have any money left over in March, they sometimes want to give you some of it. Uh, but you have to spend it by March 31. So we call that March Madness because you have, you have a two-week shopping spree to go out and buy stuff. But this was, uh, you know, last year's March Madness. This is all stuff we bought, uh, telemedicine workstations. It's not the attack of the killer clones. These are, these, are real, these are workstations. So we bought a lot of stuff, and we've been rolling out a lot of stuff. This is a growing area, I guess, is the message here. Um, here's two big ones. EICU is something we hope to be able to launch this year. Uh, what you do there is, if you've ever seen an ICU, there's a, a very sick patient in a bed. We're going to put a camera above the bed. Uh, you're going to take the monitor data and transmit that out. You're going to integrate with the hospital information system to pull out uh, uh, lab and pharmacy data. And uh, then you set up an office like this guy has in the picture 
which can be anywhere. It can be in a shopping mall, you know, wherever you want to put it. Uh, but he's able to track many patients in many different ICUs, 24 by 7. And, uh, excuse me. Um, what this means is he's kind of got an early warning system happening here, along with software that actually monitors all of the data. He's got an early warning system. And the analogy is, you know, air traffic control, right? So you can imagine an air traffic controller is sitting there looking at a screen, and there's a whole bunch of airplanes, you know, flying around, and then he says, you know what, I gotta go to the bathroom. He kind of goes, uh, 10 minutes later he comes back, looks at the screen and says, oh, this is great, none of them crashed. That's fabulous, right? Uh, and that's what happens right now in ICU. These patients are not constantly tracked. What this does is give you that warning system that they're gonna crash. Uh, and what they found is they can actually avoid about 60% of complications uh, using this technology. And those are the numbers. I didn't make those up. 25% reduction in mortality. 25% reduction in hospital costs, right? Uh, these are published numbers. Uh, that's in the U.S., of course, so we always take that with a grain of salt. Uh, but uh, if it's a half that or a quarter of that, we still have to do this, right? So we're hoping to be able to launch a pilot to do that soon. Uh, we're also going to be expanding our emergency services, so layering more applications on that infrastructure that's already built to go to more locations and for more types of specialties. Uh, and this is the big one. Uh, anybody ever heard of telehome care? One, one, two. I just had lunch with you, so you've heard of it. Anybody else? No? Anybody out there in, uh, in uh, webcasting land? Because you're going to hear a lot more about this. My personal opinion is that this is what's going to save our healthcare system from, uh, you know, basically not being able to afford our care. This is very important because right now, if you look at patients with chronic disease, uh, we actually spend about 70% of our healthcare budget managing patients with chronic disease, people with heart disease, people with kidney disease, people with diabetes. If you walk around a hospital, that's who's in the hospital, people with those chronic diseases for the most part. If Ontario has a $30 billion healthcare system, that's $21 billion that we're spending to take care of those patients. Well, we're now finding that if we can use devices in the home to track uh, their vital signs, video conferencing, other devices depending on the illness, uh, we can actually manage those patients a lot better. And I'll give you an example. A heart failure is probably the best documented uh, disease. Uh, if you've ever known somebody with heart failure, they tend to collect fluid. They, the, you know the people with big swollen ankles? You, know, you can sort of stick your finger in there and your, your fingerprint kind of stays on the, you know, the skin. Uh, well, the other problem they have is that fluid builds up in their lungs. And uh, they don't notice it right away. Uh, but eventually when that fluid gets high enough, they suddenly can't breathe. And they call 911, the ambulance comes, they go to the eMERGE, they get intubated, ventilated into the ICU for a couple of weeks. Uh, hopefully they get better and they go home and uh, three months, six months, nine months, 18 months later, the same thing happens again. Right? That's the history of congestive heart failure. Well, now it's pretty clear that if you monitor their pulse oxygen, actually if you weigh them every day and they suddenly gain a couple pounds, it's probably either they had a huge lunch or they're collecting fluid uh, or they have rocks in their pocket. But if it's fluid, the nurse gets a red flag and, and calls that patient in and actually adjust the medication and can actually prevent that patient from going into pulmonary edema. Uh, and the studies are showing that you can reduce hospitalization by 30% uh, in heart failure using this technology. It's a dramatic saving for a very inexpensive technology. So you're gonna see a lot more of this, I think, in Ontario as time goes on. And this, in fact, now is in the Ministry of Health's uh, plans as far as I can see in Ontario. Uh, the last item, oh, and here's the savings, actually. Uh, actually, this is from the U.S. VA. I forgot I had this slide. Uh, U.S. Veterans Affairs is one of the early adopters. They did a study. This had about 836 patients in it. And here's the numbers they had. So intervene means they got telehome care, and usual care means they didn't. Well, you can see there was actually more clinic visits in the intervene group. Uh, and that's because they called them into the office when there was a problem. But look at the ER visits. Minus 36 versus plus 11. Look at admissions. 46% less admissions. Okay, bed days, 61%. So these are, these are phenomenal. You don't see a lot of numbers like this in healthcare. This is gonna be part of our future in Ontario. Uh, finally, the last uh, 
the last slide here is just about EHR integration. We're not an EHR project, uh, but we need to support integration. We need to be able to deliver health records uh, to the health professionals who are looking after those patients at a distance. So telehealth will support uh, the collection of information, the collection of images, the acquisition of digital images uh, that are appropriate uh, to support uh, distant decisions. And that will include supporting things like asynchronous consultations where you collect a bunch of data and send it off and the patient doesn't actually have to talk to the doc. The dermatologist may be able to make a diagnosis from uh, digital pictures of the rash along with whatever story the family physician has, has told him or her. Uh, so they may not, I mean, asynchronous means you don't actually have to see the patient all the time to make a diagnosis and, and a treatment plan. And of course, wait list, uh, we need some way for uh, the super specialists who are deciding who gets heart surgery first, who gets a hip placement first, uh, some way for them to triage these re remote patients and decide who's the sickest, who needs to have this done first. And this kind of uh, technology will support those decisions. Uh, so I think I'm probably right on time here, and I'm going to quit right there. Uh, I think we have time for some questions and answers and discussion. Well, Ed, thank you very much. What I'd like to do is invite the uh, people who are in the uh, remote location to, if you have any questions, uh, someone will take those and then ask the uh, question to Ed here. Uh, hopefully this, we've done, by the way, I want to thank uh, Darcy and Doug Mulholland and Kyle Young, who today have experimented with the first uh, webcasting operation. Uh, we also are members of a consortium uh, related to a system called the ePresence system developed by Ron Becker and others at the uh, University of Toronto. And um, it allows us to webcast everything here. So Ed and his great beauty and his slides all go out and we are able to, um, uh, people out there are able to see them. They can hear and see. It's all done through the web so there's no expense associated with that. Uh, they can also chat back questions, and that's where the opportunity is to ask questions. We're hoping to extend this now as we move along. We understand there are quite a few people at the remote site. We're hoping to have more and more remote sites as we proceed. So hopefully Darcy will uh, be able to get any questions that come in. And uh, what I'd like to do now is open it up to questions. And because of our, our um, speaker systems, I'll try to get you, if you have a comment, this microphone. But if not, I'll ask Ed to repeat the question so people can hear it. So start out with questions from any of you or comments. It seems to me that uh, this uh, aspect of telemedicine has now gone well beyond just the uh, delivery of medical services. And you're offering an opportunity to actually plan the delivery of medicine and set policies. And I think you should work on your friend, uh, the good uh, minister, to develop a medical network policy department which would deal with it on, on the level that you have done so far. And you might be the first uh, ex you know, executive director or something like that. <laughs> well, thanks. So I've, I've got a job already. But uh, that's a very good point. I think the interesting thing about uh, IT and healthcare is, I mean, people say that IT is an enabler, uh, but those of you who, you know, code information technology know that you have to really understand the policy of what you're doing before you can actually code it. Information technology is just the instantiation of the ideas and the processes behind that information technology. And I think in healthcare, uh, it turns out that as the enabler, yeah, we're actually driving the change. It, should, it probably should be the other way. You know, somebody should be setting up some policy and then we can go do it. But it doesn't work that way. Until the technology gets into place, the, the, the changes don't happen. It's a bit of a chicken and egg thing. But now uh, you have the base. Now we have the base. That's right. That's right. So now there's, you know, there's got to be a more iterative process where we do it, the policy comes back, and we do it a bit differently uh, and inform each other in terms of where it should go. But there's, there's still huge issues that are unaddressed. I mean, one is paying physicians. Uh, you know, and they, they weren't, you know, to be realistic, nobody's going to pay the physicians for telehealth when there was no telehealth in Ontario. Uh, you know, it would be unrealistic to expect uh, Ministry of Health to suddenly say we're going to pay for a service which had no uptake, 
uh, which nobody was using and which nobody really would admit would work. Now that we've got 2,000 physician users, uh, it's a lot easier for them to now uh, change the policy and say, yeah, well, of course we should be paying for this. You know, what have we been thinking all these years? Of course we should do it. And so it's issues like that where you have to actually demonstrate the value uh, before you can expect the policy folks to follow behind. Other comments uh, from the group? Um, okay, I have a couple. One, uh, about two years ago, I think it was, uh, we had Robbie Campbell speak here. And uh, in addition to the areas, we had a lot of, yeah, I noticed your biggest bar was psychiatry. Uh, that seems to be going fairly well. And uh, uh, I don't know, do you, are you, is that your psychiatry? Is that Campbell's? Or how does that work out? Uh, that's just a lot of psychiatrists who are very busy. Uh, you know, we have some real power users who have large geographic areas and a lot of patients that they need to provide service to. Uh, for example, in, in northeastern Ontario, there's, there's very few uh, child psychiatrists. As far as I know, there's only two of them. And so they use the technology all the time to reach out to other communities. Uh, they actually work with the local mental health team uh, so that the local mental health teams can then pick up the care when they're not around to do a lot of this. Uh, we, we've actually wired up a psychiatrist's office in, uh, at her home now, actually, in Winnipeg. And uh, she provides treatment to uh, many First Nation communities that otherwise would simply not have psychiatric care available. Um, so these are, these are you know, just two examples of heavy users, and there's a bunch of others as well. Okay, I'll make sure I, I take questions, including from the remote audience. So in the back. Just wondering uh, how the system that uh, you've portrayed here today compares to what maybe some of the other provinces are doing or what even other countries are doing, such as in Scandinavia. Uh, my, my modesty precludes me from saying that we're probably a world leader in this, uh, but I think we are. Uh, we've uh, got, I'm pretty sure, more activity every day than anywhere else you'll find in Canada. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Canada Health Infoway, uh, which is the new funder to fund this stuff, uh, just finished a project with us to actually document our business strategy and our business processes. Their goal is to turn that into a toolkit uh, for other provinces that want to uh, uh, really uh, support and grow their telehealth programs. Not to say there isn't lots of good activity and lots of champions across the country, but I think that uh, you know we're one of the leaders in terms of telehealth. Uh, in the U.S. as well, we get invited to uh, U.S. events, uh, and uh, they, a lot of American groups have actually come up to see what we do, how we do. There's an ongoing discussion about uh, sharing information and working on, on issues. Uh, so I think you know we can be pretty proud in Ontario that uh, we're far ahead. And the reason, the reason we are is, uh, you know, the technology is about 20% of this. Uh, the reason we're ahead is primarily because of the folks in Northern Ontario who recognize the value of this and who, you know, at the beginning were willing to take a chance and try it out. Uh, and now are focused on it because it helps their patients. And uh, uh, that's why this has really taken off. Uh, our, our job as the network provider was to make it easy for them to do that. But we had to have the champions and the buy-in to be able to get this far. Yeah. Other, uh, I'll make sure I give everybody a chance here. One of the uh, things I know you have underway is an evaluation process, including, as I understand, economics. I think uh, it would be interesting to see how that comes out, if you have any comments on it. I was part of the uh, communications technology satellite experience back in 1973 between University Hospital and Moose Factory. And the work there was uh, done, and then a very, very poor analysis was done of that work, in which they divided the total cost by the number of radiographs transmitted. And it actually put back telehealth in Ontario by about 10 or 15 years. Uh, you know, what steps are you taking that, that the uh, information that you're uh, generating here actually becomes the basis for future uh, development within the province? Uh, well, I mean, we're trying pretty hard. We've, uh, as part of our uh, Health Canada funded project, which was 2001 and 2003, uh, we did perform a pretty extensive evaluation with which whatever we could do. Uh, of course, a lot of it was focused on satisfaction. We did stakeholder surveys. 
we, we didn't have uh, a whole lot of financial information available. By the way, that uh, evaluation is available for those who want to read it. Uh, the, uh, on the money side, which I think is what you're referring to, cost effectiveness, cost benefit, uh, the jury's still out. You know, as I said, we've got uh, one indicator, Northern Health Travel Grants, that we're reporting on uh, right now. Uh, but we want, to, we want to do a whole lot more. We want to look at really the perspective of all of the different users, uh, the patient, the provider, the organization that signs up, um, and of course the, the system or the government perspective, and come up with uh, really a convincing business case uh, around why you should do this. Right now, our, you know, the, the, most of our business case is that it's obvious that nobody wants to travel. It's obvious that you can't get emergency services any other way if you live in a rural community. Uh, and that's, that's the basis of most of it right now, Dominic. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brown, my name is Matthew Locke. I'm uh, with Nortel Networks. I'm sorry? I'm with uh, Nortel Networks. Yeah. And uh, the last uh, major area of growth that you mentioned is uh, EHR integration, right? And there are two bullets that you have there. Uh, secure access to patient record and the development of uh, store and forward infrastructure. I was wondering what uh, prevents you from doing it now? I mean, all these things are, from a technology point of view, maybe is available. Uh, what are the major issues that you feel that have to be resolved to get it done? Well, the, the uh, technology is all obvious and simple. We could have done it 10 years ago. Uh, the issues are how do we build an electronic health record? Uh, and that's the battle we've been fighting for a generation. You know, how do we do that? How do we get people to work together? How do we get comfortable with security? How do we know what to share? Uh, how do we know who to give access to? Uh, how do we know what to store, where to store it, how to store it? So those are all the huge issues that really is keeping an entire community across the country uh, busy and employed, uh, trying to figure out how to do that. Um, so we, we are not going to do that. There's uh, groups like Canada Health InfoWay spending a billion dollars on that. Uh, there's huge provincial programs and also in the billions of dollars where they're trying to develop uh, electronic health record infrastructures. Um, we hope to leverage that. Uh, the part that we want to do is create the little bit of that that is required to support all of our telehealth activities, which includes the scheduling, the workflow, and collecting the type of data that is not available from other types of systems. Uh, things like digital images of uh, dermatology patients or uh, retinal uh, images of diabetics, uh, home care data, the, the bits that are not covered in other people's domains. So if you look at places like Ontario, for example, uh, they're, they're going to launch an OLIS system which will collect all the lab data. Uh, there's going to be a pharmacy system here one day that will collect all the drug data, but it's not there yet. Uh, they need to build those and get those going, and then we'll be able to leverage that uh, uh, whatever's there. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Other questions? While I'm traveling across that, what are the skill sets that you need in your operation to keep it uh, growing? Ah, okay. Uh, we have a pretty interesting and eclectic mix of staff. Uh, we hire uh, smart, enthusiastic people. We have a culture of, uh, uh, you know, it's a very positive uh, place to work, I think. Uh, within the organization, we have a, a really uh, clinical, operational, and technical uh, folks. Uh, there's some folks who manage our technical support center. Uh, we have folks who manage our scheduling office, who are scheduling clerks. Uh, we have a lot of project managers who take on organizing projects and people. Uh, we have uh, a chief medical officer who works with uh, physicians. We also have regional staff in every region. So we have a full-time telehealth coordinator in every region. We have a regional medical director and a set of uh, uh, scheduling uh, men and other folks that support them in their region as well. So those are the kind of folks that we employ. Uh, one of the things we probably could use more of is uh, R&D. Uh, type support. You know, we uh, are very busy supporting an operational network, and we don't always have time to think about new ways to do it, uh, new, uh, you know, new types of security, new types of telehealth platforms. 
uh, we, we could use uh, some academic or R&D folks, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, uh, who could uh, support us with that type of activity. Uh, we also have a very extended large family of our member sites who each uh, provide you know, one or more telehealth coordinators who we train. They don't work for us, but we train them and they're part of the family that work together with us as well as uh, site medical directors at every site. Yeah. Uh, just to follow on, uh, one of the things you mentioned to us was uh, co-op students. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We love Waterloo co-op students. We have three in the office right now. Um, I think they're getting quite satisfying work terms, uh, and uh, we just, uh, they're, they're great. We couldn't survive without them. Uh, a lot of this, uh, our portal that you see there is uh, co-op students have been actually putting it together, supporting it, change it every time we change our minds. Uh, they, one of the co-op students produce our, the reports you saw there. That came from uh, Crystal Reporting Engine, and they did that. Uh, so uh, if you're a co-op student, uh, please come. I just want to point out that was not a sponsored link. <laughs> Hi, yeah. I, just, I had a quick comment. Um, I started my professional career as a nurse. I work in IT now, but uh, I did work on an outpost in remote Manitoba. And uh, not only as, as a nurse, and not only I think is your um, program going to be cost effective, obviously, but there's extended costs involved with care up there. For example, if you fly a mother, to a hospital someplace and who's looking after the kids and you know there, there's other expenses that you may not be measuring in the same way of strict transportation dollars and you know that kind of thing. I wonder if you had any plan to yeah. measure those. Uh, yes, well our, our First Nation partner uh, has, a, has a pretty good evaluation uh, underway. Uh, the, ex the travel expenses in the remote north are unbelievable. Uh, it's in the, the millions of dollars, you know, for tiny communities with 500 people can spend a million dollars transporting patients in and out. Uh, and really simple things can make a big difference. You know, uh, if somebody falls and, and whacks their arm, uh, you know, do you have to fly them out for an orthopedic surgeon or can they wait till the doctor comes up a day or two later? Right? Really basic decisions that if they can be supported remotely will save a fortune. So I, I'm hopeful there'll be a We have some data, I believe, on that. Uh, but I'm quite hopeful there'll be a more comprehensive study that comes out over the next year. That's uh, still early days. Um, we worked there. In addition to cost effectiveness, it just strikes me that you, you allow them to just give better care. Yep. I, I just remember taking x rays. What do I call it x rays? Yeah. And holding it up with a radiologist on the phone saying, well, it's kind of fuzzy. <laughs> right. You know, which is certainly, yeah. you know, we all knew we weren't doing the best job we could. Right. Well, it's funny because we. Uh, even the, the sense of community well-being, I think, is improved. I mean, when we first went out to First Nations communities, they were kind of worried that people would stop coming because now they had this box in the nursing station. Uh, and then we surveyed them, uh, you know, at the end of the CHIP project, and the, the folks said, you know, we actually feel like actually now somebody cares. There's somebody who's looking after us now. Um, so that, that was a very positive feeling. Uh, and, you know, if you're sick and somewhere far away, uh, just knowing that your specialist, your health care provider is able to get to your community, I think probably adds something to uh, your quality of life. Yeah. Uh, earlier on in your presentation, you jested that uh, you wouldn't want to be a, a patient of a telesurgery. And uh, I know that there is, uh, within Ontario alone, there are at least 22 cases of telesurgeries being quite successful. And I was just wondering if uh, you could comment further on what your personal reservations are, what you see the barriers to, uh, to that well, sort of technology rolling out. Well, uh, maybe if I, that's between North Bay and Hamilton. Maybe for that project I wouldn't mind being a patient, but uh, it's still experimental. Uh, it seems like it's working quite well, and it, you're right, it has been quite successful, but uh, I don't think it's ready for mainstream deployment yet. I think there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, to figure out, you know, where it should be used and how it should be used. Uh, but someday, someday it'll, you know, it'll be there. Uh, my personal feeling is, you know, right now I, I live in Toronto. I'll just go downtown and, you know, if they make a mistake, there's an ICU not too far. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, uh, it's been quite effective for the patients that have used it, and I think the outcomes, as far as I know, are, are as good as they, they would be otherwise. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I just want the other thing I want to mention. We're, we've had an underway a plan for a while now, 
uh, to actually put on a community and elder care, health informatics and community elder care area. And uh, uh, there's a very strong uh, capability here at the University of Waterloo in these areas. Might be something uh, we consider of talking about that. Uh, the Applied Health Sciences uh, faculty here has uh, a huge experience in elderly care, in uh, uh, wellness uh, and promotion. We mentioned some of those before. And it could be some really exciting exchange there as you move into that area. So I uh, also, our Community Care Access Center has a strong interest in this. So there's some real possibilities. Uh, we've looked at some technologies uh, in the United States and in uh, British Columbia uh, for wiring the home uh, where patients uh, can be uh, much more independent able to move from place to place as well as be remotely monitored and their behaviors can even be monitored. For example, uh, whether a person is uh, attempting to do something they shouldn't be trying to do or not asleep, uh, waking up frequently at night, all of those things are capable of being monitored now and some very interesting technologies. So we, we have a very strong interest and a, and a very uh, great capability here that might be interesting to talk about. Um, any other comments from you or do you want to any others? If not, uh, we thank you very much for being here. Uh, Shirley has a, uh, uh, a present for you. We also, by the way, uh, uh, did anybody know the significance of the bag? No? Read your uh, letters to the editor in the record tonight. We were named the ugliest city in the world in the Globe and Mail. That's Waterloo. And, uh, uh, a few of us got together and responded to that. And this is our improvement mechanism. So next lecture, we'll be handing these out. We would start out, I put it over my head, but it's too, I'm starting out by bagging myself. So as you have an opportunity, please pick up a bag so we can improve the image of Waterloo in the world. Anyway, Shirley, turn it back to you. Oh, thanks for giving me a bag. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, Ed. That was a very enjoyable presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of potential synergies here between your work and what we're doing at the University of Waterloo and other people that we're working with. So I hope that this exchange will continue. Uh, and I hope everyone here enjoyed the seminar today. Thank you all for coming. And uh, the folks that are remote uh, online, uh, thank you for joining us as well. I just want to make one announcement, and that is that we look forward to seeing you at our next seminar on November 24th. Our guest speaker that day is Dr. Tom Chow. He's the coordinator of the of Intelligent Systems Research at Blur View McMillan Children's Center. It's the largest pediatric uh, rehabilitation facility in Ontario. He also holds an NSERC uh, Canada Research Chair in Pediatric Rehabilitation Engineering. So he'll be speaking about the intelligent systems that he's designing. Uh, and uh, these systems are really neat because they constantly adjust themselves to match a child's changing needs and abilities. So I think it will be a wonderful talk. Uh, unfortunately, the rule came out afterwards. He, too, is a University of Waterloo grad. Uh, so, but uh, and, uh, he is uh, coming next month. So I welcome you, or I ask you to join us again next month. So, see you I'd like to make one other comment for those of you who are here and in the remote audience. Any suggestions you have on how we might use the uh, disease present system to reach out, improve this, uh, get it to more people, give people an opportunity. If you can't travel all the way into Waterloo, uh, get remote access. Could you just let us know by email? I believe you've got our, uh, well, Shirley's uh, probably the easiest email, sfenton, F-E-N-T-O-N, at uwaterloo.ca. And uh, any suggestions you have on how we can uh, make this more available? As you know, it's already digitized and put on our website, but in real time, that gives people the opportunity to participate remotely as well. Thank you. Right. Thank you.